So, Randy, you graduated from Dartmouth. Yes. Uh, Trey and Craig, you guys both went to USC Film School. That is correct. What uh, influence and impact did film school have on your careers as screenwriters? So I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, no, I mean, you, you took film classes at yes. Dartmouth. Yes, yeah, I was a film major undergrad. Okay. Uh, I would say a tremendous impact uh, from my personal experience. Um, just because you're, you're, when you're in film school, you're not only honing your skills and, and, and building a career for yourself, but you're also building a network and you become a part of a, of a creative community. And I, I, I often say to, to my students at USC, and I, I come originally from Tulsa, Oklahoma, so I kind of know what a small town's about. Yeah. I don't think there's any smaller town than the entertainment industry. And, uh, and so you immediately begin that process of, of not only, like I said, learning your skills, but then becoming supportive of others and, and immersing yourself in that kind of a networked creative community. So Yeah, uh, you know, that's valuable. the thing that we kind of talk about at DePaul, that if you, you know, when you go out, yes, you know, obviously it's a competitive business. It's always been, it's always going to be. But when you go out and you have, uh, you know, friends that have gone to film school with you or friends that you meet, when you build a supportive network, you, you cast a wider net. Yeah. And so, you know, your opportunities become their opportunities, their opportunities become yours. And so there's there's like a strength in numbers kind of thing. Absolutely. That I mean, everybody here will attest to the fact that writing can be a very lonely business. <laughs> <laughs> so the more friends you have in that process, the better. And it's only a matter of time before you wind up crossing paths with all of these people, working with all of these people. So mm -hmm. they're really important relationships to... to to begin with. Craig, what was your experience like? Uh, well, I started about three and a half hours down the road in Mattoon, Illinois. <laughs> <laughs> Another road, small town, which, right? Whichever way that is, <laughs> south. Uh, and then I went to Eastern Illinois University uh, undergrad, and then went to USC for grad school. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the same thing, you just meet a lot of connections, but the thing that saved me at USC was the director of the program I was in, the Peter Stark program, who has since passed away tried to kill me. <laughs> what? Because <laughs> uh, I came from Illinois. I'm f fresh out of the cornfields. You know, you can take the boy out of the corn, but you can't take the corn out of the boy or something <laughs> like that. Okay. Uh, so I was like very naive and all golly shucks like Opie from Mayberry <laughs> showing up at USC. Like, hey. Uh, and he's like, this kid's going to get eaten alive. So we had internships at universe, or we had internships placed between the two years. And he placed me at Universal with this lady who was feared uh, think, think uh, Devil Wears Prada for like just, a baptism <laughs> by fire thing. for just chewing up uh, interns, right? Oh, and God. he's like, okay, that will weed him out or put hair on his chest or something like that. So you know, she kind of doesn't pay attention to me very much, and then, and by the way, she's an amazing person. She was a teamster and a, <laughs> and a production man for for James Cameron. So if, Holy cow. if you for can, James Cameron, if, wow! If you can put up with that, you can put up with anything. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, uh, just, so I was thrown into that, and one time she's like, get in my office. I'm like, okay. She's like, where are you from? I'm like, Illinois. She's like, where in Illinois? I'm like, small town. She's like, expletives. Like, where? <laughs> <laughs> what small town? I'm like, Mattoon, Illinois. She's like, Mattoon? With the original Burger King? Oh, my God. My dad was from Danville and was a truck driver, and we used to always stop. There you go. This, oh, and wow. Then took me under her wing and became a mentor and... and Sort of set me up with uh, this director Joe Dante, who moved to Universal mm -hmm. a lot. Sure, yeah. They called her, say, "Hey, we're we're moving to Universal. We need sort of like an office boy mm -hmm. uh, slash a second assistant for Joe." And she's like, "I've got just the person. Don't hire anybody until you meet with Craig." So the guy yeah. trying to kill me started my career. And when <laughs> I was with Joe, that's when I sort of learned to write by reading scripts and talking to writers. And here I am. Oh, that's because amazing. he tried to kill yeah, me. Yeah, I mean Joe Dante is like he's the you know the '80s Spielberg kids. Yeah, movie yeah, thing. still one of my all-time favorite directors. Yeah. So, so um, Randy, how did you land your first screenwriting gig? Um, my first writing job was in TV. Um, I I got a lot of people, a lot of coffee. <laughs> um, I was an assistant. I moved out to LA right after I graduated from Dartmouth. Mm -hmm. um, and Dartmouth's film program was mostly theory, two screenwriting classes, both of which I took. 
Um, the greatest part of it for me, though, is just the legitimacy of, oh, not only is this an academic discipline, which I learned very quickly, like, I, I, can, I can do that and I can major in that, <laughs> but then, like, oh, some people do this for a living. Right. Um, but so right after I graduated, I was from the Boston area, packed up my little Toyota Corolla and drove 3,000 miles west. I literally stuck By my yourself? Uh, with a couple friends who were headed to Seattle. Uh -huh. I literally, I stuck my, this is ridiculous, I stuck my feet in the Atlantic Ocean and then got in my car. And then when I got to LA, I stuck my feet in the Pacific. Oh, so there guys. also may have been some singing of Barbra Streisand. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, my, I worked odd jobs. And the one thing my dad, the advice I had was, make sure you have health insurance. <laughs> make sure you have health insurance. So I, out of college, I have an Ivy League liberal arts degree. I'm applying for a job at Jamba Juice. Um, I got a job at Borders, which was a bookstore. That's a place where they used to sell books. <laughs> um, and just kept applying for stuff. And the good thing is, actually, even coming from a sort of unlikely film school like Dartmouth, I had a number of friends who had moved to LA, and we were such a tight knit mm -hmm. group mm -hmm. um, because we Dartmouth were friends. That moved yeah, to LA. we were just you know these kids from the from the wilderness now suddenly in the big city. And a friend of mine was an assistant for an agent, and mm -hmm. I had applied for all these jobs. I knew I wanted to write, and I didn't know the way to get there. And I had a friend who was an assistant for an agent, and she said, we just staffed, meaning got a job for, a staff writing job for, um, the writer's assistant on King of the Hill, which means they have an opening. Mm -hmm. And so she sent my resume over there. And it, they ended up filling that position from within, yep. but one of the co-executive producers, Jonathan Collier, uh, had an opening on his desk as his assistant, personal assistant, which means you answer his phones, you get him coffee, you do whatever he needs, which in his case was really very little. Um, and at this meet interview with him, he said, um, I really want to hire someone who wants to write. Nobody ever says that to you. Mm -hmm. I, you, know, you usually have to pretend in order to it's get an assistant job of, that yeah, that's okay. not what you want to do. Right. I really want to be an agent. Great, you're hired. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so after I picked myself off the floor, I said, okay, and that was my first... My first in um, was working as an assistant on King of the Hill, and I just learned so much about TV production. Mm -hmm. I started writing specs, getting mm -hmm. notes. Anyway. And it all came from, you know, like what Trey was saying, that it, you sort of had the widened Dartmouth net. The that, Dartmouth yeah. Mafia. Yeah, yeah Dartmouth it ultimately Mafia. did. It ultimately did. And yeah. at that time, I mean, just sending out um, letters upon letters, mm -hmm. you know, really, I went through the binder of here's graduates who are now out in LA and uh -huh. just sent them blind query letters essentially saying will you sit down and meet with me yeah I was much braver then than I am now <laughs> um, hunger will do that yeah <laughs> and and John I now sort of jokingly refer to him as my wealthy benefactor because he ended up being really instrumental in getting me my first writing job he had been approached by Hallmark to do a pilot about their Maxine character. Mm. Um, this Maxine kinda, character? Maxine is like the crotchety old lady that, you know, I hate Mondays or whatever it is okay. on the mugs. Okay. <laughs> uh, and he said, I would always talk about my grandmothers, a Jewish grandmother, Irish Catholic grandmother. They said they wanted him to do this pilot. He said, I will, but I don't really like old ladies. You know who really likes old ladies? Randy Barnes. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, would you write this pilot? I'll be your supervising producer. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, okay. And that there was my that first. That the Guild? I had Chinese been, Chinese yep. Got, well, it was animated. Uh -huh. So not really. But what it did was I'd been hip pocketed, which mm -hmm. we can talk about, by an agency. Yeah. That there suddenly was a deal for them to negotiate. So they signed me. They sent me out for staffing. Two months later, I got my first staff job, which was an Olsen Twins show called So Little Time. Mm -hmm. That's great. Now, Trey, you also started in animation, right? The Timon and Pumbaa? Way back when, oh, yeah. Wow. Uh -huh. uh, I wrote some uh, Disney cartoons, the, the, three hyena, the Laughing Hyenas and also Timon and Pumbaa. Um, and done some feature work in animation, too. But. Would you guys say that um, there's, uh, is my, my first produced gig in TV was uh, the Dumb and Dumber animated series wow. for ABC. Mm -hmm. uh, which my, And my agent at the time, literally his office was a closet. <laughs> that He represented legal secretaries and me. <laughs> 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 Everyone got 10% to him, you know. Um, but like, what, what I've noticed is the animation world, and, you know, not, maybe necessarily Family Guy or Simpsons, but in terms of like uh, children's animation, 
there seems to be a path of, uh, the door seems to be cracked open maybe a little bit more for people to, to get their first produced writing gig. I was gonna mm. say it feels kinder and gentler to me. Yeah. Animation yeah. was, during the times when I was not <coughs> on live action network shows, animation was the, the warm home to which I could return. Mm -hmm. Always, you know, one gig led into another. It just felt like there was, once you were in, you were accepted, people loved you, you kept, you got calls. Yeah. yeah. Craig, what was, um, what was your, your journey from graduating from SC to getting your first uh, writing gig? Uh, well, after uh, the director of the program tried to kill me and it backfired, <laughs> and, uh, and then uh, Donna Smith, the lady, hooked me up with Joe Dante, I uh -huh. sort of, I was working on a script the whole time, and I became like his de facto script reader, because they, they had a story editor and a director of development, but they would just get all these scripts, and one time they're like, hey, could you, read some of these scripts and do coverage on them. Yeah. So I did and they liked my coverage, so now I was like, here, read all of these scripts, do coverage. <laughs> <laughs> so I learned to write by reading good scripts and by reading bad scripts. And I would study all the great scripts, including some scripts written by guests who are here later. Uh, <laughs> I would study their writing and try to mimic it. And were they good scripts? They were very good <laughs> scripts. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Um, so I taught myself, you know, if you want to write like Shakespeare, read Shakespeare. Um, mm -hmm. So I taught myself to write, and Joe went off to make this movie called Matinee in Florida, so I had the whole office on the Universal lot, which is an adventure in and of itself, because I would pretend to be Joe often and invite people <laughs> to, uh, <laughs> cruise around in the carts and stuff like that. But I, I wrote a script, and then I got hired to work at Nickelodeon as a creative exec, uh, and during that time I finished the script, and there was this guy I'd been talking to on the phone a lot who was an assistant at ICM, but his boss wouldn't promote him because he was the guy that was finding all the talent for his boss. He's like, no way, I'm not letting you go. So he like discovered this niche for market, uh, this niche in the marketplace that didn't exist at the time, which was management for writers, because mm -hmm. he saw that writers were being neglected by agents. So he started managing writers, and I sent him a script once that that I had written with a fake name on it. Uh, and he's like, hey, I like this guy. I want to sign him. And I'm like, it's me. Uh, so was that Santa's book of names? No, this was called uh, The Hollow Gang or something like the that. It was like okay. Goonies meets The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. It was like way back in the 90s. Okay. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and then he uh, introduced me to this agent, Jeff Robinoff, um, who signed me. And then they sent that script over to Chris Columbus, who liked that script, hired me to write a movie for him then gave me a two-picture deal, one of which was Cheaper by the Dozen came out of that. Wow. And I've just sort of been writing ever since. And then years later, Chris and I, you know, So your first things. writing gig was a two-picture <laughs> deal for Chris Columbus? Well, there is a picture I wrote for him, a script I wrote for him that he liked and then gave me the two-picture deal. Oh, yeah. my God. Uh, so, and then, uh, you know, I, he went and did this little Harry Potter thing and I went I've heard of that. Yeah. and did some things. And then our paths crossed again with Percy Jackson, so. Uh, Small town. Yeah, small town. <laughs> you know, the thing that I've heard about Chris Columbus is that Chicago. he's mm -hmm. Chicagoan, mm -hmm. that he's like like phenomenally nice. Like in, in what, like 20 years, no one has ever like quit his production company? Mm -hmm. No, uh, yeah, it's, it's still the same people. In fact, somebody from Matt Toon mm -hmm. works for him. There's actually, actually a Matt Toon mafia. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, kid you, I kid you not. Um, but we, like four guys? No, they're, they're like, Ten of us out there now. <laughs> Luke Ryan, who produced the Harold and Kumar movies. Yeah. Uh, great uh, Michelle guy. Miller, who works for Chris Columbus. This guy, Joe Webb, who just staffed on a huge Fox show. I just got the wor word. Um, so I, I have what I call my lucky couch, which I refuse to get rid of, because I was the first guy to break the barrier and come to L.A., so I'm like uh, the godfather, so you come to L.A. <laughs> you like, you sleep on you, Craig's you gotta couch. Craig, you got to meet Craig, you kiss my ring, you sleep on my couch, and, and, the, and the magic couch works, because then they all, like, Good job, and they surpassed. I mean, Luke ended up hiring me to write Twenty Thousand Leagues Under Sea when he was at New Line. So oh, he started wow. on my couch, then hired me. So there there's this go. huge Mattoon Mafia in, <laughs> in uh, LA. Well, I, I'm just amazed by the longevity of, of your career. So you guys have have been working like nonstop. Is it is the key being someone that that works in both television and film, not pigeonholing yourself? What what have you experienced with that? Well, maybe a, 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 another way to look at it is just keep working. Yeah. Just keep generating content. Um, you know, you got to keep putting new, fresh stuff into the pipeline. 
you get better and better the more you write, and uh, and you it's like putting more chips on the table mm -hmm. uh, in Vegas. You know, uh, the more chips on the table, the greater your chances of winning. So you, you know, you just keep doing it, whether it's whether it's in television or it's in features. You're still honing your craft. And, now, when uh, you guys came out to LA, did you initially say? Think you know I'm coming out because I want to write for TV or what was the the journey? I came out because I had spent all of my allowance in the summer of 1977 to see Star Wars 11 times, and uh, <laughs> and all I wanted to do was uh, was be in the movie business. But um, and that's what I did for the longest time until mm -hmm. I got my first. Uh, television series on the air and then then I completely fell in love with that yeah so uh, so is it what would you say um, I, I want to ask all you guys like what what are really the pros and cons in terms of writing for features and writing for TV what do you what do you love about each what do you hate about each TV I think and and one of the reasons why I initially got into it I was rather naively thought oh, I'll write for TV to get a job in film. <laughs> I mean, like, I thought that TV was an easy path. Um, <laughs> and none of them are particularly easy, but the thing about TV is that there is a little bit more of a system. Um, you know, you can go from being an assistant on a show to being a staff writer. There's sort of more of a, it's a little more like the army in the sense that there are these ranks, whereas features can feel a little more random. It's getting your script into the right hands. Mm -hmm. There's a little more, at least initially, hustling in order to break in. And then hopefully there's you know, things perpetuate. The other great thing about TV is it can be a little more steady, at least in my experience. Also, yeah. I mean, you have a place to go. You have an office, you know, that you drive to in the morning and they expect you there. Writing features, you're at home by yourself or, you know, I wrote one feature with a partner. Mm -hmm. um, but for the most part, it just feels a little more individual, unless you're developing for TV. Now, mm -hmm. do you guys like that, that camaraderie of like working in a writer's room, you know, uh, bouncing stuff off other people? I love that. I, I, you know, like I said earlier, you know, especially screenwriting can be, uh, while lucrative and, and an amazing creative experience, can be very lonely. And uh, to be in a room with other living, breathing human beings and, <laughs> uh, and bouncing ideas is, is a tremendous experience. It's also just television. Uh, your your level of creative involvement is so much higher. You know, on, on a feature, it, it may be different if you have an incredibly close working relationship with the director and you're sort of blessed in that way to be a part of production and mm -hmm. all of that. But in general, you're more of a gun for hire and it's the director's medium. Whereas in television, it's the writer's medium. And yeah. so you're not just writing and working with other talented writers, but you're involved in every making every key creative decision in the process from casting to hair to set design to locations. So it, you really get immersed in, in all of it, which is incredibly rewarding to me. So Craig, tell me, um, you know, we've got uh, a lot of students that are gonna be graduating soon, uh, gonna be coming out to LA, looking to break in, get their first job as, as staff writers. Um, what, what, what have you seen like on, on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. or, or uh, The Cape or you know, other stuff? What, uh, what would you say are like some total do's and total don'ts in, in writing, being a staff writer? And, and train Randy, I, I wanna know what you guys think too. Well, I, I think it goes back to um, playing well with others and m most of my career had been in features. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's an interesting thing I learned about TV which is why I love it so much and I may never go back to features. <laughs> uh, because I love writers, I love talking story with other writers, I love reading other writers' scripts. And yeah. In TV, there's this group of writers and generally respect for each other. You help each other, you read each other's stuff, mm -hmm. and you have each other's back. In the feature world, they pit writers against each other. The yeah. system is designed to make you aggro <laughs> against other writers. They throw you off projects and bring people on who will rewrite scripts because they want the credit and then they all go, it's arbitration and you're all fighting for or, credit. Or you'll, like what I've heard and is like, they'll have writers that are in tandem writing the same yes, project they and will, not even they knowing will do that. That happened so, and I still know what you did last summer. There were two really? scripts commissioned, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. it becomes very doggy dog and it, it pits writers against each other and we're all, we're all going through the same stuff together. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and it's just sad, that mentality and the features and and it's so different in TV. Yeah. It's like everybody hangs out together. And yeah. TV is a, it's a writer's back. medium and it's a writer's community, really. Yeah, 100%. And, and you learn so much from other writers, you know. Yeah. It's good to be around other writers. So, Randy, what, what is like the biggest do or don't in being a staff writer? As a staff Getting writer? Getting your first job on a TV show. Um, I think 
to know that you are there to learn. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it's a it's a tricky line because on the one hand, you know, you're there and you're you're new and you want to prove yourself, and so you're probably gonna err. I would err on the side of I guess. I, 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 yeah. Um, <clears throat> knowing knowing when to speak and knowing when to be quiet. Honestly, I think that actually the most important thing you can learn, and you wouldn't think that that would be a part of a job like that, is listening, mm -hmm. um, which I think is important. You don't have to feel like you're always singing for your supper, that it's a learning You're there to learn, and yeah. you're there, you know, there are people there with a lot more experience, and if you remember that and really listen, and uh, I'm an improviser, and one of the sort of tenets of improvisation is yes and. Mm -hmm. um, whatever people give you, you say yes and this thing. We're on yep. the moon, yes, and isn't it nice? Or better than that. <laughs> um, but I think, honestly, that that's a great rule for any writer in the writer's room to yes and other sure. people. Yeah. Also, one of the greatest pieces of advice I ever got was when I was a staff writer on a show called Lost at Home, short run on ABC, um, one of the more senior writers said, don't ever point out a problem unless you have a solution. That's right. Yeah. And that creates, it does, it, it creates such a different vibe in a room when instead of saying, yeah, this part doesn't really work, you say, what if we did this instead? And it doesn't even have to be a good idea, right. but it at least gets people talking. A and solution. it feels yeah. so different yeah. than if you said, yeah, I don't like that. And I find that even when I give notes to friends. Mm -hmm. um, it's a huge thing that, that improvisation has enforced for me, but is just saying, what about this instead? And yeah. then it becomes a dialogue right. rather right. than a almost a put down. Okay. Well, well Trey, you know, you're you're the showrunner of The Messengers. Yeah. Um, have you I don't want to put you on the spot, but have you had an experience in the past where you've had to let go of a of a writer on a show? I have. Uh, and it's uh, it's frankly awful. I I, I uh, What they do? Uh, <laughs> you know, um, uh, it's awful, but it's always awful to, to have to part company with anybody, I would imagine, in any business. Yeah. Um, uh, but, you know... Uh, but if it disturbs the herd, you know, you kind of... That's part of it. Sometimes, you know, sometimes you could be the greatest writer in the world, but it's not necessarily because you spend so much time together in a room. Yeah. You want the skill sets there that complement each other, but you also want the personalities that complement each other because you're going to be in the trenches a lot together. So mm -hmm. sometimes you could have the most talented writer in the world who just personality-wise doesn't jive with everyone else. You've got to create the writer's ecosystem. That's exactly right. right. That's exactly I've right. I've often been told that, that the initial meeting, you know, when you're meeting on a job, the interview is, would I want to spend 12 yeah. hours with this person? Sure. She's would right. I want to be with this person at 3 o'clock in the morning? Yeah. Right, because by the time I'm meeting with a potential writer for a show, like, I've read them. I, they're there because I like what I read. They're, mm -hmm. like, they're there because I've you know, reached out to the creative community to get intel on them. So yeah. I, they're already there. The meeting at that point is about, do I want to hang with you? <laughs> you know? So true. Well, we're going to uh, take some questions from the audience. Uh, do we have some folks lined up here? Oh, the little light is on. The Pretty mic is there. Okay. So, um... Come on. Oh, there goes one. <laughs> <laughs> no, she's leaving. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. How you guys doing today? Hi. Great. I have like a twofold question. Um, one, which even though you know you went to your schools that you went to and you had your fields, how did you know that what you're doing right now is what you are destined to do or what you were passionate to do? And also, um, when you had your roadblocks, your stumbles, your nose, your closed doors, what made you keep pushing? That's a great question. It's a persistence game, first of all, to speak to the latter. Um, you got to steel yourself against that rejection because it's going to come. You know, it's a very, very subjective art form in the same way that you all can go to the great Chicago Institute of Art and walk from painting to painting and either shake your head and ignore one or stop and admire another. It's very subjective in the same way on the page. And so some people are going to get your work and other people aren't. It's just that simple. So you keep writing it, you keep putting it out there, and sooner or later you're going to connect with somebody who's going to understand what it is you're trying to say and be equally passionate about it. Uh, so that's the quickest yeah. way to answer that I one. Think, uh, to the question of how do, how do you know, I've heard so many writers of different media say, if you can not do it, don't do it. Yeah. Because it's not easy, because there will be those rejections. Um, and I do think so much of it is just taking the hits and continuing to move forward because it's something you feel you have to do, you want to do, you're driven to do it. Um, you know, it, when it, 
you don't choose it, it chooses you. Yeah. Yeah, it's not necessary. It's not an easy road. Um, there are yes. high highs and low lows, um, and I think, but it tends to. It seems to me that people who stick with it tend to tend to make it through and make it out. You know, there's there's always there's the people that I call. Um, they take the midnight train to Georgia, mm -hmm. which is people that I know <laughs> who moved out to LA and eventually say, "Ah, eh, it didn't work out." Um, if you want it to work out, you'll make it work out. Uh, for people that have questions, could you please line up uh, behind the mic? Yeah, there's the old, I don't know who was that said it, Mae West, I think. Uh, it took me five years to become an overnight success. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's definitely yeah. applicable to yeah. uh, You know, writing. an agent once said to me, it's, uh, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's 100%. Do you feel that way, Craig? Yeah, and, yeah, and I think you just have to... So many people go out there like, oh, all these other clods are making millions writing scripts, I'm gonna do that. For me, it's you just have to love writing and storytelling. Yeah, yeah. And if nobody ever hires me again, I'll write a novel. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and yeah. I had a film yeah. professor who said, a film production pro professor who said, you have to love the process. Because he mm -hmm. says this is a long process and you never know what's gonna happen at the end of it. If you don't love the process, don't do it yeah. for that end thing. You have to. You can find a mutual love, find it. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, hi, next person. Sure. Yeah, hey, uh, yeah, thanks for being here. Uh, of course. So awesome. Yeah. Uh, quick question. It, it, those, you know, those low lows, maybe when you're like having a block, right, and you just you don't know how you're going to get out of it, and eventually you do. What, what, how do you rejuvenate yourself? What do you each do, if you mind sharing with us, what In you do to get out of those <laughs> situations? Drink. In and Out Burger's big, yeah. <laughs> uh, Scotch. <laughs> Scotch. Scotch is important too. Right. Uh, you Xanax. know, so often I'll try and find, for myself, I'll try and find some other creative outlet. I'll try and, this is why also <laughs> it's, it's mandatory, you know, in the messenger's writer's room table, it, if you walked into the writer's room, you, you might for a moment think you just walked into a preschool classroom because, <laughs> because there's Play-Doh all over the tables, there's, you know, cards, there's uh, pens and crayons of every color, uh, because I'm a big believer in that sort of creative distraction whenever you hit a road Roadblock, you find another creative way around it. You engage your mind creatively in some other way. So for me, you know, I'll go draw, or I'll go record some music, or I'll, you know, or or I'll go read something just to sort of get out of my own headspace long enough to free up a little extra uh, room for for the next idea. I want to come work for you. <laughs> yeah, well, Play-Doh, awesome. uh, right? Big, big lover of Play-Doh. <laughs> um, uh, often when I'm developing. Uh, meaning doing a work for hire, developing a pilot, um, I will, I'll read books on it. Um, I feel like y you never stop learning and there's so many books out there about the craft of screenwriting, conversations with other writers, and reading those, even if they're just, you know, hearing another writer go, yeah, it gets hard, just giving yourself permission to know that all right, it's not it's not coming today, um, but that really often helps or gives me some sort of inspiration. Watching other people's stuff, reading mm -hmm. other people's stuff, mm -hmm. um, you know, we always refer to it as like filling up the well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do you find, Craig? Uh, I think whenever I get stuck, I, I usually one of three things: I either go for a drive, go for a run, or just go hang out with friends who aren't in the business and normal don't people. Don't yeah. Give a crap about the business. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but also in TV, I've I've learned that. There's no such thing as writer's block because you, exactly. you don't have that luxury anymore. <laughs> There's always a deadline. Yes, yeah. you're like, oh, I have to write this how fast and <laughs> okay and yeah, because in features I was always so precious and yeah. everything had to be right. I mean, I would I would spend more on a sentence in features than it takes for an entire episode of television. Yeah, this is yeah. true. Uh, and you, so you really learn that writer's block is just a, a thing we I don't know <laughs> convince ourselves exists, but <laughs> just keep typing. Do we have uh, time for one more question? Yes? Hi. 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 Okay, so I have a question about trying to do this from Chicago. I mean, is it realistic? Can you do this? And, and if so, do you know of any resources um, in LA who are willing to talk to Chicago writers? Or is it even realistic? I mean, do you really need to be there? You, you could more likely get started on a feature career from another location. Um, TV certainly. I mean, TV is all done out of Los Angeles. I've only heard soap opera. I have York. a friend that lives in Lake Forest <coughs> who's written on a soap opera for 15 years. But that's really the only area. Yeah, that I've heard and for TV and ultimately, writers. meetings, connections, all of those things. You'll, you'll at the very least be flying to LA mm -hmm. a lot mm -hmm. if yeah. it's going well. But you've got to be in the writers' room, and most are 
LA. Most are yeah. LA based. That, that being true. said, you can write from anywhere. Um, you know, so you can create your inventory, but then I do think, and you'll hear from a lot of the stories that we've told, it also ends up being the people you know, the, con the connections you've made, and so to that end, it does help to be in Los Angeles. But she can write a, a feature spec anywhere yeah, she exactly. wants. Yeah, exactly. You can write from anywhere, and, yep. and managers uh, are very accessible uh, in LA, and you're, even their, their assistants, you can send scripts to them, and have them read it, and if they like it, I mean, a quick story, the guy that wrote the American Pie movies, Lyndon, lived in uh, Grand Rapids, oh, no right kidding. across the lake, um, found this management company, talked to the assistant, like, hey, I wrote this Simpsons spec, would you read it? He's like, okay, I'll read it, and liked it, gave it to his boss, he's like, and his boss at the same time was like, I want to reinvent the rated R teen comedy, they've been dead for a while, and he read the script, like, this guy would be perfect for that, so he called him and was like, do you want to write this rated R teen comedy? So he wrote it from Grand Rapids. <laughs> it was American Pie. It sold for like a million bucks. Then he moved to L.A. Wow. So you can write from anywhere. And the access isn't all that difficult. By the way, the first thing I would suggest you do is kiss the ring of the dawn of the corn. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Come and Stay on his couch. Right? couch. Touch the couch. <laughs> kiss the ring. It's, all, it's magic. Do you, do you have any managers in particular that are willing to work with new writers? One or two that you even know that... Uh, well, you know, you could check with the Writers Guild of America. Mm -hmm. There's a directory. Uh, uh, Deadline.com is a great source that has information. Um, I'm going to also suggest something I do for writers trying to enter the business, and I'd love to hear your opinion on it. I recommend there's a few contests that yeah, I the, would recommend. Yeah, Blacklist. Is, Absolutely. Is Blacklist, yeah. certainly, yeah. Scriptapalooza. Mm -hmm. The winners of those, and usually often like the quarterfinalists or the semifinalists, um, get read by representation. A and medical fellowship. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's a yeah. Yeah. tremendous it's, one. Sundance. Mm -hmm. yep. It's way easier now to become a writer from somewhere else. We had to be in L.A. pretty much. Yeah, but yeah. that's true. Yeah. Thank sure. you. Uh, we've got time for two more questions. Uh, next person, please. Hi. Hi. Um, so you're talking a lot about uh, connections and like that being really important. <laughs> Let's say you moved to L.A. and you know nobody. Mm -hmm. What's like the first? Well, you've got a thing guy from from Oklahoma and a guy from Mad. They didn't too. know anybody. <laughs> That's right. I moved uh, uh, to Los Angeles uh, with all of my worldly belongings in the back of a pickup truck, and I knew not one soul. Uh, but you know, all it's going to take for you is walking down to the corner Starbucks, and you're going to see a row of laptops of people who have also just arrived. <laughs> And you engage them in conversation, and by the time you leave, you're going to have just plugged into your first creative community. Um, everyone out there has got their own version of the same story and are all trying to basically accomplish the same thing. So it won't take you long. Yeah. It, it just happens organically. You'd be surprised. <laughs> okay, cool. Thanks. Hi. Hello. Hi. A uh, question for Craig. Could I get the address of where the couch is located? <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, actually, seriously. You got to go through Luke Cage first. <laughs> yes. um, it is uh, it's guarded by the uh, by Thor and the Avengers. Right now. <laughs> Craig, you'd brought up the topic of reading scripts in order to improve your writing, but mm -hmm. the question, I guess, is actually for all three of you. So, I'm wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more about when you're reading scripts, what you do to basically reverse engineer what to do, what not to do as a writer, and learn from them. And is it different? for reading television scripts because those are more of a, even if there might be one name associated with them, they're more of a product of a collaborative writer's room environment as opposed to a feature, which is one or you know, maybe two people usually. Yeah, yeah I, I, th I think there's no difference. It's just, it's just good writing. Like if, if you're reading a story and you're really engaged, you just kind of like step above yourself and like, okay, why am I engaged? And oh, this is interesting. They introduce this character. I don't know everything about him from like one line of dialogue. Wow, how did they do that? Mm -hmm. um, S scenes, there's just so much. And But you also conversely learn from like reading really bad scripts, which I read a lot when I was working for Joe. It's like, uh -huh. I'm bored out of my mind. Why am I bored out of mind? Oh, it's because they're doing this, 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 and this. Mm -hmm. And just the more you read, you just pick up little tricks like, wow, okay, this thing where I had this three-page scene, I could actually do in a line of dialogue. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's very economical. Uh, it's Boy, the list is just endless. Yeah. box list, even an unofficial one in your head, that you kind of knew things to look for or not, you know, to... Yeah, yeah. I mean, there actually is a list of things on <laughs> yeah. when you do coverage, you have to <laughs> check coverage, dialogue, yeah, good, bad, excellent, story, good, yeah. bad, excellent, you know, all that stuff. Um, 
yeah, yeah, it's, it's all that stuff. And, you know, their scripts are, when I started reading scripts, I had them order them from this place called Script City, and then they would yeah. uh, ship yeah. them to Mattoon, Illinois, and I'd get my box of scripts, so like, oh, <laughs> a platoon. I think Platoon and Rocky were the first two I bought. And now simplyscripts.com is a, a free yeah. website. Yeah, and now you can go you on the website and just, yeah. and I, I still often do this, like if I'm about to start a movie, I'm like, think of movies that it's similar to, genre, yeah. and I'll, I'll find the scripts and, and read those and yeah. see like how they were telling that kind of a story or developing that kind of a character. So um, we, we need to wrap up, but I just want to ask if you guys could um, give us one final quick piece of advice for people that are about to, to trek west. What, what would you say? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> one, one piece of advice. One piece of advice. Okay, well, I sort of spoke to this already in terms of it being a persistence game. You know, you got to just keep going and keep going and keep going, and you got to convince yourself that the minute you give up is the minute somebody's going to step over your dead carcass on their way up the red carpet. <laughs> um, uh, but um, uh, but I, w I will also tell you this. Uh, it, is, it is well worth all of the effort. It is the greatest job in the world. We get to make things up for a living. And that is a great privilege. And I, you know, there are tougher days than others to be, to be certain. Uh, and there are years of rejection that lead up to it. Um, but I can't wait to go to work every day because I get to play in that sandbox, which is truly incredible. So yeah. jump in, the water's warm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Randy? I'm going to steal from Nike on this one and say, just do it. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to do it and, and you feel the, the pull to do it, do it. Do it. Keep doing it. Don't give up. Um, you know, that's, and, and tell yourself that every day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I think just before just do it, give, give yourself like a, a reality check. Why are you doing it? Make sure you're doing it because you love this. You want to tell stories. Yeah. You love writing, not just like, oh, all these other clods are doing it. I might as well. Yeah. And, and then, uh, and then you'll, I think, survive and endure and grow. It's it's not a lottery ticket. Um, it's a it's a career. Yeah, yeah. And it's, and it's, it's hard work yeah. too. Well, folks, please give a hand to our guests. Thank you. Thanks so much. <laughs>